What, what is AI? That's actually quite a difficult question. Um, the first problem is you need to define what intelligence is before you can start talking about what artificial intelligence is. And good luck with that. There's something called Tesla's theorem, which is sometimes also called the AI problem. And that states that intelligence is whatever in artificial intelligence has not yet done. Uh, you can draw a parallel with biology. Once upon a time, human intelligence was seen as special because humans used tools, and then we found animals that used tools. And so the goalpost shifted to say, um, yeah, humans make tools and therefore we're intelligent. But then we found that chimpanzees and some other animals make tools and the goalpost shifted again. In AI, one of the common benchmarks is how good computers are at playing games which are associated with intellect. So in the 50s, there were programs built which could play tic-tac-toe. The way they worked was to have every possible laydown of the noughts and crosses in their system and the optimal counter move. So they didn't understand the game. Now, unsurprisingly, people didn't feel that that was true intelligence. Interestingly though, 40 years later when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess, some people said the brute force approach which it used, which uh, calculated thousands of different options at a time, uh, also wasn't real intelligence. And that I think is a, a pretty dubious claim, but I can see to some degree where people are coming from. Uh, it is unfair though because Deep Blue had the ability to prioritise its considerations and to learn from past games. Another definition was based on the Turing test, whereby a computer could be said to be intelligent if it can fool a human into thinking that that human is talking to another person. Um, but that was actually beaten in the 60s by a system called ELISA, or ELISA, I can't forget which way it's pronounced. ELISA had sophisticated language recognition, but actually um, the way it responded was very simplistic. Uh, you, it picked up on a particular word and then it responded with another phrase. So something like, uh, if it picked up a mention of mother, it would ask, how is your family? And that's no more sophisticated than that tic-tac-toe machine. Um, so I understand why at that point people move the goalposts, but it, it doesn't really help us tie down what does constitute intelligence. There's two main concepts that we deal with. Um, the first is automation, and that's where a machine can conduct um, simple tasks by obeying rigid rules and actually of course if you've got enough rigid rules that can become quite complex so things like that tic-tac-toe playing computer or ELISA are good examples. We also talk about machine learning which some people see as true AI um, and that's where by doing the same task the system can learn and improve upon its performance. One of the good examples of this is uh, a program called um, AlphaGo Zero uh, Go being a, a game played a, a lot in Asia, similar to chess in some respects, which um, has been beaten by this particular program. And that program uh, learnt the whole thing from scratch. It started off with random play uh, and then built up to beat the world champion. Um, and finally, we also talk about another concept. Uh, we call it ag algorithmic warfare, and that's the ability to process, analyse, disseminate and utilise big data. Uh, which is of real uh, utility on the battlefield and, yeah, and, and in normal business. Um, it's something that people like Google do all the time. In this context, autonomy is when a machine can conduct a task without a human directing it. Um, so some of you may have a self-driving car, there are some on the roads, um, and that's clearly autonomous, but it's not all or nothing. Um, so you may well have a car um, which needs to be driven on the roads, but it can self-park, and that has an autonomous capability. You find something very similar on the battlefield. So a system like Watchkeeper, which is a British UAV, um, will land itself. And actually, as you control it, and this is true of a lot of UAVs, um, rather than the, uh, the controller flying the air airframe, what he actually does is direct it from point to point and tell it where to fly itself. Um, and the same is true of some ground systems. Uh, you can have um, an unmanned ground vehicle uh, which will be directed to go from point to point, which has its own software to avoid um, big dips, um, boulders, and it can uh, na navigate around them. Um, and, or, or it could follow the low ground. Um, and there are other functions where it can just follow a person or perhaps a vehicle or another robot.
Swarm technology is where you have a number of systems operating together. And I remember this being talked about a lot in the 90s when it was a way of overcoming the, the problem of getting enough processing power into a small robot for it to function. If you design an autonomous system from first principles, you don't need it to look like a truck or a car. Um, you can have something that is quite unusual. And if you look at some of the current rescue and survey vehicles, um, they look odd. Um, they're not recognisable as a particular vehicle. Swarm technology really goes a step further because rather than taking a vehicle to do a specific task, um, you have a swarm, um, you, know, you have multiple uh, systems that operate together. They're communicating together normally, well, so, yeah, they're communicating together and they're working towards a common task. And they can all, as a result, be quite simple um, and yet together they can achieve really quite good effects. Um, in terms of military applications, it's very easy to think of uh, a couple of hundred UAVs or a couple of hundred underwater unmanned vehicles each carrying some small explosive charge, swarming a, a, an enemy vessel or a camp and then detonating simultaneously. Uh, it would be very difficult to prevent that. You're talking probably about quite small systems, hard to hit, uh, and there's a lot of them and you need to get rid of the majority of them to really impact them. Um, but there are much wider, uh, there's much wider utility for these than just an attack, uh, an attack uh, task. I've seen video, which is uh, quite beautiful to watch actually, of um, a group of, I think it's about six mini UAVs building a rope bridge. Uh, and they knot the ropes and they can cross a gap. Uh, and that bridge would carry a fully laden infantryman. Now at the moment, the British infantry footbridge uh, requires most of the back of an eight ton truck to move it. Those robots would fit in um, a sort of carry case and then the ropes could be thrown in the back of um, four or five soldiers' backpacks. Uh, and that's a huge advantage over these big bits of kit. Talking about how much of a, of a difference autonomous systems make isn't entirely straightforward. A lot of countries are working now on fully autonomous systems. So Israel have trialled uh, aut autonomous patrol and surveillance vehicles along one of their borders, um, but they don't seem to have kept those vehicles in service for any great length of time. Uh, we also have South Korea, which has got an autonomous surveillance uh, post um, guarding part of its border, but it is only a two and a half kilometre long stretch, um, which is pretty inconsequential across the whole of the uh, the border. Uh, and if you look at defence shows, there's a lot of individual systems that pop up and by the following year they seem to have disappeared. Um, so these things do seem to be proving the concept of autonomy but at the same time they don't really seem to be catching on. Um, they just seem to really be in extended trials periods and the, the question is why? Um, are they actually providing anything that's militarily useful? Um, now we know that Russia is trying to build an autonomous tank at the moment uh, the T-14 was supposedly going to be the first one, um, but actually the Russians have moved back to um, an older, cheaper T-72 chassis. Uh, and that's not unusual. A lot of the autonomous vehicles that you see out there are existing man vehicles, which have had AI and a little bit of hardware um, bolted on. Um, and that may have some advantages over a manned system. Uh, for example, if it's operating a CBRN environment, um, yeah, clearly the crew are not exposed to poison gas. You also don't have to deal with crew fatigue. Um, but there are issues that go with not having a crew. So if the tank throws a track, who's going to mend it? Uh, if the sensor, uh, sensors are covered in mud, who's going to go out and clean them? Um, it's, yeah, there's pros and cons to having an unmanned system, but ultimately it's not really, uh, yeah, an autonomous tank isn't really going to change the face of the battlefield. If, on the other hand, you were to look at something like an autonomous jet fighter, which had been designed from first principles, then you could do away with the need for a cockpit, uh, you could do away with the need for ejector mechanisms, and you don't need to worry about the effects of G-force on the human body. Um, and then you can have a very different, more aerodynamic, more effective um, jet fighter. And that really does change the balance. AI is actually already used extremely widely within the military. Um, 
if you look at your phone or uh, your SLR camera, if you've got one, uh, it'll have an autofocus function, and that is driven by AI. Um, and virtually any modern sensor you find is going to have something similar, which helps it reduce background noise, sharpen the image, or whatever. Uh, and then you have AI doing other tasks like uh, cross queuing and directing um, different sensors and different assets, and also things like you know, if you've got two sensors finding the same target. AI will try and determine whether that is indeed the same target or if it's two different ones being you know, hit separately. Um, and a lot of hardware um, has some degree of AI driving it behind it. So things like software defined radios will have AI in them. And then we have AI managing data on a massive scale, which is already happening to some degree within uh, headquarters. Uh, this year, TRADOC in the States ran their Mad Scientist program, and they were looking in particular at AI. Their initial observations are already out and are worth a read. Um, they assess that in the future, AI will be ubiquitous uh, and thus increasingly invisible to service personnel. Uh, it won't be something that you turn on and off, it's just there, it'll be running continually. There are a range of barriers to bringing AI onto the battlefield. When it comes to things like data handling, we're already pretty much there. Um, firms like Google have had military contracts to handle big data, uh, although Google pulled out. Uh, there are other companies doing the same sort of thing. Uh, the same is true of sensors. There's already AI being used. When it comes to autonomous machines, though, there are a number of barriers. Um, the first is that militaries tend to be quite conservative. Uh, and so in most countries, they'll tend to be somewhat skeptical of new and novel technology. I think most service personnel at some point have been burned by getting a new piece of kit, which is shiny and attractive, which actually took a long time to learn how to use, which didn't quite work the way it was supposed to, and then which got broken and had to be carried around and was quite heavy. Um, and that, that experience does tend to shape people's opinions. Uh, then there are pure technical issues, such as how much data the machine needs um, and whether you can fit that processing power into the chassis uh, and indeed, you know, does it need to connect up to other systems. But one of the biggest issues is the reluctance to put lethal effects in the hands of machines. Um, the US Congress this year, uh, sorry, last year now, uh, as we're in 2019, um, reasserted the requirement that a human must always be in the loop on those decisions. Uh, which makes a lot of sense and which is a widely held view in the West, um, but it does put substantial barriers in the way of developing autonomous tanks and jet fighters, for example. Um, and importantly, it's not a barrier that really affects the Russian or Chinese development programs in any meaningful way.